Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, what is the tenth and final of these past to Utopian Conversation events. My name's Neil Denny. We're being broadcast live on the internet by This Is Tomorrow as well as speaking in this room. Um, so you can relive this event later if it, if it takes your fancy. Um, we're going to be talking about the, the overall project of, of Utopia 2016 and um, Paths to Utopia today. Um, and I'm joined by Karishma Rafferty, Andy Franz Koviak, and Dr. Reese Williams. And I'm going to ask you all if Karishma, you'd start. Okay. Just um, say something about yourself and, and then I guess your role in this, in this overall thing. Great. Um, yeah, my name's Krishma and I'm an events curator over at uh, Somerset House Trust. Um, and in terms of Utopia, I suppose I've been largely kind of responsible for producing and pulling together a lot of the very disparate parts of our programme over the course of the year. Andy? So um, my role has been to produce and curate the collection of work that's made up past Utopia. Um, which has taken in about 25 different separate projects and trying to piece those together um, in some form of coherent narrative that audiences might enjoy. And we'll talk about how successful that was <laughs> later on. <laughs> Reese. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a lecturer in contemporary literature at Exeter University. I was at King's uh, when the project started. And uh, when the initial kind of meetings were going on um, as to the kind of concept, I suppose, behind Path to Utopia. Um, I took part in those meetings and I gave some advice, you know, whatever good it was, uh, from my own kind of specialist position, I suppose. So, well, let's carry on from where you've just left off, Reese, and talk about how this project came about. I mean, obviously, the, the, uh, you know, the incentive was the 500th anniversary of Thomas More's Utopia. But, Commissioner, let's talk about the, the Utopia 26 concept, first of all. Mm-hmm. When did this first, when did this first come about? Well, it was actually a bit before I got involved. Um, two uh, arts advisors of ours, Ruth Potts and Gareth Evans, uh, they had uh, wanted to do, they had identified that it was the 500th anniversary coming up and they had thought it was a good idea that someone somewhere was doing something about it. And I think there was a discussion with um, our director over at Somerset House. Mm-hmm. and. Um, at the time, he was uh, talking very much with uh, the Courtauld and King's College, and there was a wish to do something all together. So I think all that just happily coincided, um, and it was kind of taken on by the three partners as something to develop together. And is so Paths to Utopia, the particular strand that you're the, the creative director of. So tell us how that came about, how, that, how you got involved with the overall project. So at King's, um, we kind of believe that um, the work that goes on, um, the amazing research and everything that goes on within the university is something that needs to be shouted about to the general public. And the best way to do that is via the arts, we think. Um, And so when the theme of Utopia was put on the lap of um, the cultural team um, with Alison Duthie and and Leanne Hammercott um, via Somerset House, um, it felt like a really um, exciting opportunity to actually try and engage a number of academics, put them with artists, um, and see what would happen. And so we kind of held very kind of simple open spaces, seeing if um, these two groups could get together and, and really find out whether there was any you know, resonances between their practices, between their like, goals of what they'd like to, to try and put together. And quickly found ourselves with, you know, dozens of proposals coming through from those, and so it was sifting through those to um, turn that into something as part of Utopia 2016. Um, And so in terms of past Utopia, I I think it was early on, the idea of Utopia always being, is a journey. And so um, we very um, quickly and with lots and lots of important meetings decided past Utopia. (laughs) would be uh, potentially a way to, to kind of present that um, as a whole. Reese, 500 years, right, it's a, well I mean, presumably the idea of utopia mm. has survived 
better than Thomas More's book. I'm sure not many people necessarily read the book now, but everybody has a sort of concept of, of what utopia is. Are there, I mean, can you think of any other ideas that have transcended their you know, source in such a, in such a way? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like, slightly disagree okay. <laughs> with what you said, only because um, I think to say that the idea of utopia has survived is a little bit of a misnomer. Mm. Um, I think that the idea has changed quite radically sure. um, since Thomas More's kind of initial naming of the genre, right? And everyone knows that the idea is that it's uh, like a no place and a good place. Um, his book has a very particular structure where there's two halves to it. Um, the first half is a kind of explicit critique of the conditions of his period, the kind of status quo. Mm -hmm. And then the second half is this kind of imaginary island that we now you know, think of as utopia. So the, the, the first half, I think, is forgotten often. Um, I think all too often nowadays utopia is a, a synonym for you know, wishful thinking, yeah. for uh, unrealistic ideas, uh, for you know, ideology, that kind of stuff. And I think we forget that a, a kind of core purpose of utopia is for it to be critical of the status quo. I mean, I think that's a really kind of key thing that gets lost often. Um, a big part of this, obviously, was in the 20th century. You had people like Karl Popper, Hannah Arendt, you know, very famous uh, kind of philosophers who were impacted very strongly, you know, as, as most people were, but impacted particularly strongly in terms of their personal experience um, by the Second World War and by things like um, the, way, you know, the, the way that the Russian Revolution obviously soured with, with Stalinism and so on. And so utopia becomes associated with totalitarianism, with this kind of top-down imposition, um, which uh, you know, caused a lot of violence and a lot of pain for a lot of people. And they argued that utopianism was necessarily violent, I suppose. Um, and that really became the kind of uh, common sense understanding of utopia uh, over the 20th century. Now, I think it's interesting that we are starting to, hopefully at least, claw back um, some idea of utopia as not necessarily this kind of imposed plan, but as uh, a space for thinking about genuinely alternative uh, kind of ways of living, alternative ways of organizing ourselves, alternative ways of doing things, um, which don't necessarily have to be so kind of top-down and dictatorial, but in fact can be very liberating and very kind of creative. And then... As for this idea of you know whether or not we could think of other things that have transcended their sort of source, I, I was trying to think of some while you were talking, and mm. and all the ones I can come up with actually are either other utopian novels, Gulliver's Travels or something, for instance, mm. or Brave New World or 1984 dystopian mm. novels, which are things that you know you could stop somebody in the street and ask them to name some key elements of, and there would be things have entered the culture from those novels yeah. without having to have read those novels. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I think that probably that's true because it's such a kind of potent idea, mm -hmm. right? Everyone uh, has an idea of what a kind of better world would be like. I mean, a, re a really key element of utopia is that it's uh, a picture of desire. Maybe that would be a kind of interesting way of putting it. Um, they're all very individual because, you know, they're authored by individuals traditionally, not so much now, but... Um, and they're all pictures of desire which spring from a, a particular kind of lack in the status quo. And again, I would come back to this idea of a critique in the status quo. Um, and with a dystopia, it, it's kind of the reverse of that coin, really. Um, it's tendencies in the present which pose a, a kind of threat. Uh, if they were allowed to kind of continue or grow mm -hmm. or expand and so on. So obviously Brave New World is still potentially the most accurate dystopia that we have, right? Because 1984 at the time was more uh, popular, but its idea of what the kind of ugly future would look like is kind of retrograde now, actually. Whereas Brave New World's idea of, you know, a kind of general public... Uh, trapped by consumerism, mm -hmm. essentially, trapped by individual desire. I think that remains quite sharp uh, as a critique. So yeah, as you say, these ideas transcend their origins because I think they have resonance with individuals. Every single person can understand what you mean when you say, you know, what would you like to be better? And mm -hmm. how can you imagine this getting worse? You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're very kind of common ideas, I guess. We're going to go through, we've, we've got a number of slides, or Karishma and Andy have got slides which demonstrate um, both past the Utopia and their overall uh, Utopia 2016 projects. 
first of all, I want to talk about the slide that's up there now, which has the uh, sort of the branding on it, and you can see it on this um, this stand behind us as well. Either of you, I don't know who, who would have been more sort of like involved in that at the time, but tell us what this means. Uh, well, it's, but we know it's, it means it's utopia. Actually, it's We're actually guess a mishmash that. of uh, <laughs> Somerset House and um, King's approach to it, but yeah. uh, it's, it says utopia yeah. in Utopian, which uh, Thomas More, in the kind of first few pages of the book, he transliterated the alphabet, um, which has meant that there's lots of opportunities for fun mm -hmm. name badges and tags and translating things throughout the year that we've been um, working on. Should we um, perhaps talk about, let's, let's have a look at the first slide, Jesse, if, if we may. Um, so this is the, the entrance to the, uh, the Past to Utopia <laughs> exhibition. So Andy, I'm going to ask you to talk us through your slides, first of all. So we asked um, a team, Nissan Richards, to kind of provide us with a, a, um, a transformative space, a kind of transporting space. Um, that audiences come in from the outside and, you know, at the time when this went live, Brexit had just literally just happened. And so all of a sudden, like, the outside world was a very kind of um, around London and people around the, that you meet was some sort of space that was kind of hard to get your head around what it was. And so a space that suddenly you, you walk through, there are mirrors at either end, you see yourself... Um, taking that journey, that taking those few steps from this outside space, and it wonderfully trans, I think, it wonderfully transported you into the next place, this utop these utopian ideas, this utopian collective of projects, which are, again, we're, we're not, we're trying to say were uh, answers to the utopian question, but again, very much as Reese was saying, like, demonstrate some of the realities of that word with ideas that people have today. And so we wanted to try and think of a space that meant that they would leave, perhaps, hopefully, leave the outside world, the other side of that little. So I think it's kind of a bit, perhaps, like when you're in an aeroplane flying over the top of um, like a mountain range or something like that. It, it does have a print of a map on top of it. Um, but a lot of people like to think it's a cave. And, and that's OK. Um, but therefore, it kind of is a space that people makes them think as they step through and they come out the other side and are hopefully are able to encounter the work, the art that's on the other side of it, a little bit kind of, I say cleansed is a very strong word, but like of what's on the other side of that um, space. So that, that's what that is. Um, and it's really interesting hearing people talk about actually some of those things as they walk through it, that it's something that is uh, um, people stop and think and, and then carry on into the space. We should say what Past to Utopia is, perhaps, so I can sort of pop down view of what the, what the project was. So Past to Utopia started, um, as I say, um, with a series of uh, connecting events and ended up uh, being a collection of artworks from film to performance to a choir um, to um, a kind of more standard art collection to... Um, and a, an immersive um, temple to mythology space, um, all of which really have their own um, sensory um, experiences to them. And all of them are just the tips of icebergs of um, artist ac academic collaborations that, like, I, I can see the bottom of the iceberg having been around the, all these works as they've. Um, you know, evolved and materialised into past utopia. And so all of the, you know, I, I can reduce it down into the fact that this collection of works tackled, you know, in the tiniest of ways, tackled the ideas of education, of healthcare, of creativity, of um, nature, um, of imagination, of housing. You know, all these things that actually, when you place them under the utopian banner... Um, are, are some things that utopian texts take places they, they explain and try and um, think of ways to, that, that we could be doing it better. And so this, these works are, are, are kind of these artists and academics coming together and, and doing that um, and in a really interestingly different ways. Just to say as well, one of the key um, 
kind of structural components of utopia is that it always happens in an other place. Mm -hmm. So the, the initial kind of mountainous range, as Andy put it, like flying over the mountains, that kind of thing. I think the, the point there was to imitate that, uh, to, to give people the experience of that. I mean, early on it was uh, an island that had been undiscovered. Later on it became, you know, the future. Mm -hmm. But there's always a rupture between the utopian place and our kind of, you know, contemporary society. And the point of that is to provide a blank slate for the imagining of difference, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, what was trying to be achieved in that initial kind of room. Commissioner, I said we've got some of your slides to look at a bit later on. Mm -hmm. um, but more generally, past Utopia obviously was just one of the strands under the Utopia 2016 banner. Mm -hmm. So just give us an idea of some of the other things that were going on. Um, I mean, the, we've had a huge range in terms of kind of scale of projects, mm -hmm. but I suppose some of the bigger ones, I mean, right around the time that Past Utopia was opening, we had a utopian fair in the courtyard which brought together lots of different um, artists working diff with different communities from around the UK. They came to the courtyard outside uh, for a weekend. And we've had various exhibitions. Uh, there was the International Fashion Showcase, which was different young fashion designers from around the world that kind of flew in and uh, their brief was Utopia. We've just had the London Design Biennale, which again, mm -hmm. lots of different designers from around the world reacting to that theme, Utopia by Design. Um, we have a kind of hub space that we've kept throughout the year in amongst all these different projects called the Utopia Treasury, which is down in the Great Arch Hall of Summerside House. And in there we've had, um, you know, on a week-to-week -week basis, we have like lunchtime talks on a Thursday and Friday that are just kind of 15-minute snippets We've had different art installations coming and going. So it's, it's been quite a, a breadth of types mm -hmm. of activity. And we talked about the, the lettering that was part of the branding. Tell us about the flag. The flag. Um, well, kind of fairly early in our planning, we kind of thought, oh, we need an identity. We need to kind of come together underneath something. Um, so there was a, a conversation with artist uh, Jeremy Della. Uh, who brought on board Fraser Margridge Studio, which is a graphic design studio. And we asked them to think of, okay, we need some kind of branding, we need a website, we need, uh, we need, we need things like that. Um, and also, we've got, we've got the Union Jack on the top of the building, like maybe we could do something with that. Uh, so they proposed all kinds of different uh, interventions around site, many of which never came to pass, just because of scale or ambition. Um, but one thing that they, did actually is uh, they took the Thomas More's Utopia text and they decided that they wanted to translate it and give it away as an artist edition, which is what you all have on your um, seats right now. And that was, you know, we didn't commission that, we didn't ask that, mm -hmm. it was just something that they said, oh, we think this is a good idea, would you like to do something with it? Um, so on the morning that we, uh, we kind of launched Utopia 2016, a year of imagination and possibility, we um, we invited everyone from across the site uh, and beyond um, to the courtyard and we raised a flag. We had uh, uh, the National Youth Orchestra um, play a utopian sound piece and um, we gave everyone a book and that just kind of felt like a really nice way to kind of bring all these disparate uh, things together and start a year together really. We'll look through the slides of the past Utopia projects. Andy will give us a, a brief capsule description of, of what's going on, but if, if recent Kalishma as well, just feel free to jump in and comment if you, mm -hmm. how many of the uh, installations you actually got to see. Um, but talk, we'll, we'll comment on them as we go along. So um, if we could have the next slide, Jesse. So this was uh, um, Night School. Yeah, Night School and Anares, which um, that's wonderful graphics by Nesta Pestana, who's a wonderfully talented um, artist. Um, but it was a collection of um, artists working with linguists, essentially, from King's and Asia Pedagogists. Um, and they came together to uh, take Ursula Le Guin's um, work, The Dispossessed, there, and on that is, planet, is the planet Anares, an, an anarchic planet. And they wanted to see what a class room could be like on that planet. And so they created a, a class which audiences came to, they put tickets for, and we had uh, you know, 20 odd people coming every week to learn um, a new language, the language of Anares, um, and also how would the English language 
how would you change the structure and the English language if you were to, to be on this planet? And how does that change the sense of ownership, the sense of profit, the sense of community? Um, using this very, you know, very simple but such a great um, idea when audiences walked through and, and okay, sat down and we, we marvelled at the fact that Martin, the academic, was every week coming to, to meet another group of essentially mainly 20-somethings who were really interested in this idea and, and language and, and it really was a, an invigorating early space um, that had really interesting tones to it and there was an early um, event that happened that was very much about what does, what does anarchy mean um, you know, in relation to ideas and in the relation to sense of being and sense of place. And so I think it was a, a project that we had school groups come in there as well. So like eight, nine-year-olds came in to create these little clay models about what you wouldn't find on an ARES. So like social media, wanted a little clay representation of social media as part of that. And so as a, a breadth of different people from different places who came to different elements of you know, part of utopia. It was really interesting just to see people, and you know, analysing utopia, and then actually, I think, analysing their their own reality, as in a sense, with utopia from age eight through to you know everything else. The dispossessed race. There's another, you know, another place. Yeah. Um, and again, perhaps an idea that you know people probably know that the dispossessed is about anarchy in some related way, without actually knowing anything about its plot. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great book. Um, there's essentially a distinction drawn between a planet Anaris and another planet Uras, and Uras is more of a kind of capitalist planet, basically. Yeah. Um, and Anaris is a kind of anarchist utopia, um, although it is specifically called an ambiguous utopia. And the reason for that is because it's imperfect. So by this point, we're in the kind of 60s, 70s, and when people are writing utopian fiction, they've moved away from this idea of a kind of static blueprint of perfection. Not that, I mean, I would argue that that was never the case, but anyway, that, that's the kind of common idea mm -hmm. of it at least. Um, and people are writing utopias which are self-critical. So in the, co in the course of the dispossessed, um, the hero uh, is born in the utopia, but there's problems with it. It's kind of uh, fossilizing, essentially. Mm -hmm. it's, it's becoming a kind of state. And uh, the, the aim of the story is to think about ideas of kind of permanent revolution and how might one in, even in a utopia, encounter issues that would need to be overcome with utopian thinking, essentially. Um, and the language is uh, a really great, this was a really great project, I thought, because um, the idea is that the language on an Ares is, is structured so that you don't have possessives. So you wouldn't say, this is my handkerchief. Um, if someone asked you for a handkerchief, you would say, oh, you can use the handkerchief that I use. No, there's no possessives there, essentially. Mm. And I think the idea of uh, a utopian language opens up a lot of really interesting doors, actually, because a lot of what's happening now um, in, for example, contemporary radical politics is, is concerned, on one level at least, with the kind of structural inequality and violence that language does, which we don't really notice, necessarily. So things like um, you know, personal pronouns for mm -hmm. transgender people, that kind of thing, there's a lot of uh, struggle over how language can oppress, but also facilitate and free. And I think that this is a, a kind of really interesting way of thinking through that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's also interesting how resistant people are to that sort of thing as Absolutely, well, which yeah. just seem like such a, such a simple concept to grasp. Well, I mean, with, with any genuinely, as I said at the beginning, with any kind of genuinely utopian effort, there is uh, disruption to the status quo. No, it threatens the way, the way that things are. And of course, people are threatened by that. Of course, mm -hmm. they are. You know, people people sink their identities into the status quo. They they live a particular way for a certain amount of time, and change becomes, you know, almost like a direct attack, essentially. Um, and you see this everywhere. You know, this is a very kind of constant thing. So I would say that reactions from you know genuine anger all the way down to oh, I think it's silly. I think all of those reactions are just you know reactions to change, mm. essentially, um, which we have to overcome, right? <laughs> Let's move on to the next, the next slide. Um, so that's a, a couple of embryos. Um, all the things you are not yet. All the things you are not yet, which is a beautiful piece. Um, so that was a photo taken of two um, fertilised eggs, essentially before they were then placed into the... who would become a mother, and they went on to become twins. 
And so the artist, Karina Thompson, um, working with somebody in, our, in informatics at King's who created a kind of... So there are speakers, mini speakers, hidden within that piece that you need to touch. And it's very quietly you hear the twinkle, twinkle um, playing. And it's, the project is about family, essentially. It's about the family unit and the way that science and technology now is able to provide a, that family unit for, people, for, for couples, potentially, who would not have been able to do that. Um, however many decades ago. So um, it really is uh, analysing the, um, the need for that, that unit and how science you know, can, over, can overcome the, um, you know, whatever barriers may be actually put in our way. So in terms of bringing you know, science into Utopia or past Utopia, it was a project, there are other projects that did it as well, but it was a project that did it very naturally and very kind of... Um, using a beautiful story, a beautiful, happy, utopian story, because obviously IVF doesn't work for, for many couples, but um, it, it, it highlighted, the, for me, the kind of, the breadth of um, ideas that could be incorporated into you know, the, the word utopia, essentially. Let's move on to the next, next one, which I think, yeah, so this is the, the huge urn from the temple, from... Um, from this was last week's talk, actually, in our hands, which is, is an exhibition that's split into two parts. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, Lagun Collective, who are a wonderful group who find utopia essentially every time they get together to create something. Um, is is what they discovered in conversations with Richard Howells, the, the academic. So his work is all about the fact that creativity is the the act of creating. So the act of making is is that utopian mm. space that we all find. All cultures have found it. Um, throughout time. It's just something that we can't help ourselves but do. And so Lagan have taken myths from across time, from across cultures, and turned them into this wonderful space. Um, they had a, sh a shamanic ritual in which they created that amphora and all the walls that adorn uh, the temple of, um, to perpetual myth. Um, and because it's their practice, you know, the point was that these two, you know, the academic and the artist come together and kind of the sum of their parts makes something, um, you know, great, hopefully. And so their practice is something that this lent itself to this idea in their conversations. Um, you know, that what was beautiful about so many of the projects was the fact that they really, um, there was little, you know, having to sit down and really thrash out what on earth people were going to do. They were just bouncing off each other in terms of ideas. And so the room next door to this has a collection of works from the Courtauld, which talks through um, one, okay. Roger Fry's fascination with form, um, again, like through history. So the, 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 the African mask, um, Navajo rugs, um, cultures, cross cultures have always been fascinated with um, the idea of form and the, and the idea that we can create something perfect, perhaps. Um, that is otherwise quite functional. So a rug or a hat or what it, whatever kind of um, it is, we, we, need to, we need to keep striving to make it more, um, I guess, in one sense, utopian. Um, and we talked about, Rhys, about, you know, obviously the idea of utopia in art and literature, but here, you know, this idea of applying it in, in everyday life as well, in the things that we do. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, t to be honest, in a sense, that's the kind of more important one, uh, for me at least, is utopia as a kind of rearrangement of the way that we live, uh, the social relations that we have, uh, the way that we organize ourselves, that kind of thing. I mean, the idea of, of, of the act of creativity as uh, a kind of utopian space that, that we all kind of find, um, I think that's completely valid and completely mm -hmm. true. Um, but I think behind that, uh, there is a need to question uh, the privilege of having the space to do that in the first place. Um, you know, there, there isn't necessarily access for everyone to do that kind of thing. Not everyone's lives are, you know, uh, set up to allow that space. And I think, you know, if, if you really want to kind of think this through, then a more kind of thoroughgoing utopian critique would be to think about how to provide that space for everyone. That would be a, you know, a, a kind of genuine utopia, I suppose. But the, the aim remains, yeah, I think, I think space of creativity is, is a very lovely encapsulation of, of the idea of what utopia might be. Commissioner, I wanted to talk about how you responded to this, this exhibition particularly because as, you know, as, a, 
as a curator here at, here at Somerset House, some of these objects mm -hmm. came from here and from the court hall. What did you think of this one? Well, I, I just found the kind of the, the journey that the different groups of people went on the kind of most interesting thing, because I suppose I knew a little bit about a lot of the projects very, very early on, but just was very impressed by the time that paths opened to see mm -hmm. the kind of after all those conversations and people who maybe not necessarily being used to working with people across disciplines, that felt to me like the most interesting and exciting thing about it all, really. Mm -hmm. And Andy, that has come across in all of these conversations that we've had, the excitement of people working across disciplines. I mean, did you, see, you obviously witnessed that as you, were, uh, as you were overseeing this project? Yeah, and um, all the groups were... Um, had some wonderfully ambitious with their ideas as well um, through no encouragement from me <laughs> and so therefore um, <coughs> being around those conversations there was very, you know, there was very little um, you know, pushing from me to kind of go into places so the choral piece where they suddenly were scaling to trying to gather a choir from across the UK mm. representing like the demographic, you know, on paper that's that's a crazy idea that a group of people are going to try and figure out the best way to do that, to create this one day utopian moment um, that can happen. And it's just one example of the fact that um, so many of the ideas pulled in extra people. So the Natural History Museum being involved with the whale projects mm. and um, that, that was just, again, a kind of marvellous collection of people that... that were talking about, um, and one of my favourite things that I've heard is Philip Hoare talking through the, our attitudes to nature and how that's gone through from the 17th century, no real concept of us, the damage we might be doing, mm -hmm. um, through to us suddenly marvelling at it because we're starting to scientifically understand what might be going on and the grandeur and the kind of what on earth does that mean for humanity to kind of the... Um, 20, you know, 2006 when the whales swam up the Thames and we were tried our hardest to save it mm -hmm. and so we've gone from you know rampant destruction obviously we're still not great but actually having a concept now of the fact that we need to, to, to make this natural world you know this, this utopia of our natural world because of the fact that we've done so much damage so how can we as guardians now and it's, it was just another you know just amazing concept that fell into this collection of work. I think the, the next slide actually is of um, the, the whale project. Which, mm. So this was a film that was... Yeah, so it's a triptych um, that never plays the same way twice, um, that tells the story of a whale that swam into the Thames in the 17th century and foretold the demise of Cromwell. Um, so that brief, brief republic utopian attempt that, that this country had, um, followed by Moby Dick, which Melville um, dreamt up whilst walking the streets of the Strand and, and, um, and other areas of London, um, and then the, the whale that swam into Thames in 2006 that we tried our hardest to save. And, um, you know, it's the sound of whales that, that, that are kind of encapsulate that room and um, the, the, the bones and the majesty of the creatures. It's... Um, it, it's, it's, as I say, it's such a visceral journey, I think, that has been created within the small Inigo rooms that kind of sits down there. That certainly when, when, it, when we opened, I, you know, it was really invigorating to walk through these ideas that had materialised in such a, um, you know, in a way that obviously made perfect sense to me. Um, whether others found it quite so easy to, to wade through, <laughs> that's another question. Let's um, move through the next couple of slides. So just, just tell us something about the next couple. These are... So we, um, we had a, a number of proposals on the table and we really wanted to pull the health schools at King's. So King's is, has a gigantic um, health acumen um, sitting across Guy's, St Thomas's, um, King's College Hospital down in Denmark Hill with amazing people doing amazing work. And, you know... Again, utopian texts talk about healthcare, talk about caring for each other, and, and so it felt like we really should be 
um, pulling some of that work into the idea, into this utopian, under this utopian theme, presenting it as part of this journey that audiences could, could go on to try and understand um, the, the reality, I guess. And I think that one of the wonderful things about these works is that the reality that they added. These are actual kind of... So this is a beautiful picture of... Um, a lady who has just um, been told that she is now free of TB um, and that a um, group of nurses down in South Africa, this is a research project um, in the nursing school at King's, were given disposable cameras and they just documented their, their life, their work. Mm -hmm. And so a, this like, wall was filled with photos of people of loads of different faces, loads of different places, and it... Um, it added a real dimension of the reality of people working to try and do something like utopian with their with their lives, um, in the, like in, in that everyday sense. And I think it was a really poignant element to the exhibition. I think it's important as well, actually, on the point of healthcare. I think this is a really kind of easy point to make. Um, is that these kind of individual utopian results or moments or experiences? Um, and the work that went into making them happen are embedded in a, in a kind of larger system. Right? Mm -hmm. Like right now, we're kind of struggling to save the NHS, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think it's important to remember that it, it's it's not just this kind of like obviously as individual human beings we find it very easy to connect to an individual experience like this, and, and there's a beauty to it and a kind of um, a power to it, an emotional power to it. But hopefully that emotional power can then be kind of linked to the, the much larger struggle, for example, the junior doctors mm -hmm. strike. You know, I think this kind of thing is equally, if not more, utopian in a sense, because this is the product of a, a system which is under attack. You know? mm -hmm. And fighting to save the larger system, although it's harder to grasp, it's not as kind of emotionally engaging, is kind of more important because it's what produces these kinds of things. Yeah. I also thought there was something really interesting in what you said about the everyday. And, I mean, although over the course of the year there's been lots of kind of big things that have happened involving lots of people actually reflecting back, it's always been those kind of quite intimate conversations about something utopian between two people or kind of just kind of quite quiet special moments that have uh, been scattered through the year that actually seem so much more important and something that I think hopefully we're kind of celebrating as we go through the year. The next one is more science. This is one of the um, the utopian lab stem cell hotel. Yeah. So obviously the stem cells need somewhere to stay. <laughs> they are. Um, yeah. So this is just a wonderful idea, a wonderful crazy idea from um, a group of scientists over at Guys who work in stem cells, and so they have a stem cell hotel, and so they then brought their stem cell hotel into um, Somerset House temporarily, and it was just a um, the projection of, of again, it was, so the idea was that we wanted to try and, you know, it was a bit of a documentary element to the exhibition. So the work that, that's all in there is, is documentary. So the pictures that are of stem cells are actual research pictures of them analysing their, their, you know, their, um, taking pictures, images of stem cells um, as they're kind of developing. So um, we really wanted, I mean, some of, the, some of this is really complex ideas. So, you know, how do you present that within, um, you know, a gallery space, within a, a, an art space to people who are maybe, you know, encountering, you know, this in this way, certainly for the first time. And I think that um, it probably had degrees of success, if I'm totally honest. And I think that um, when you have such a striking uh, neon sign that kind of, then envelops everything else in that kind of blue wash <laughs> around the exhibition. But it was a really um, wonderful, um, again, part of the journey of people trying to piece together what, what's actually going on out there. Um, these, you know, in, in terms of the future, um, the, these again are kind of cutting edge future, um, you know, near future like ideas that are materialising and where will we be in like 10 years with stem cell research and you know using the word utopia I think actually um, is a risky thing to do potentially around some of these ideas and they um, wonderfully embraced the idea of having their work presented in this way 
in the exhibition? I mean, technology, particularly medical technology, has a long history of being uh, split into utopia and dystopia, right? If you think about science fiction, mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, any kind of new technology has both utopian and dystopian potential. Um, so when you're thinking about things like where is stem cell technology going to go, or um, we had the kind of embryo implanting earlier, I mean, that technology is obviously wonderful. Uh, the question is, how is it then deployed in the future? Mm -hmm. Who has mm -hmm. access to it and so on? Um, and that's yeah, really or great. Or Craig or... Yeah, yeah, or precisely, yeah, anyway. exactly. Or, you know, what was that awful film, Elysium, right? Where, like, mm. all the rich yes. people have, you know, eternal life and all the poor people. So that's the kind of... That's what makes something dystopian rather than utopian, you know. It's the technology itself is, is not good or bad. It's the way that we then embed it in larger kind of social systems. The next one, again, I think is another a good example of, an, of another place, mm -hmm. um, the sort of community created up in the clouds for people to visit the clouds. This is the naming of the clouds. There was this outside movement going on in this uh, yeah. in particular photo. So the first, the first day this was on, I'd just come back from the, what, the first uh, pro-EU march that was kind of taking place um, in central London. And so we kind of had just visited that with all the tumult and everything around that that, that, that fort, and then arrived on the river terrace at Somerset House, but they're such peaceful and, you know, full of imagination and full of daydreaming and full of um, just precise um, movement that it felt like a really poignant, you know, off, offset to that, again, the reality around that was around it, the, the hectic um, nature of the city that it suddenly kind of finds itself in mm. the middle of. And I, and I think that, you know, that idea of um, within cities having spaces like this and moments like this that people can encounter, and because obviously all of this is free, all of this was presented to people just to encounter it, maybe for a fleeting moment or maybe to the whole sort of three months that it was on. And um, it was just wonderful to kind of see people staring from afar at this, this group of probably rather strange looking, you know, cloud workers pushing their balloons around the, the river terrace. Um, yeah, it was, a beautiful, it was a beautiful little um, daydreaming moment, I think. You mentioned coming answers. back from the march, and I mean, I guess obviously we could say this about any year if we're in it, but this, this year, what with Brexit and, you know, the looming spectre of Donald Trump, it doesn't seem the uh, most auspicious year to be celebrating 500 years of it. Utopia, does it? That's why it's more important. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next one of these slides, there's a couple of slides which we can go through them. Oh no, sorry. This is um, we're here, which you, you've already uh, you've already mentioned the uh, the choir of um, a large demographic of people who had never actually sung together mm. before, which mm. was the the key element. That I don't think it, I don't think you mentioned before. Yeah. We talked about that in one of these talks, and I can remember talking to Bach Wally about that and saying, you know, it's an incredible idea, could be amazing, it could be a disaster, but, you know, I guess that doesn't really matter, it's sort of part yeah. of the point. Yeah, yeah. How did it go? Uh, it was, uh, yeah, I, again, I got swept up in the moment, <laughs> so um, I think it was just another beautiful little um, fleeting moment of utopia that's happened kind of this year. And, um, what I have projected on everybody else that was standing there <laughs> is certainly that I think that um, people got the journey that this was. So for all these people who went to the workshops in Leeds or Manchester or, mm. um, and the idea of lending their voice, so the, so the words that were used in this were provided by them. And so they, they had a f totally understood the words that they were singing. Um, and it really added, I think, a layer of comprehension to the, the voices and to the moment. And as I say, they performed three times in the courtyard of Somerset House, which for many of them would have been this un incredible moment. Mm. And so I think that people who managed to be there, and there was a really lovely audience around it, I think got, I, I, I think got swept up into um, the emotion of it. And it felt like a really beautiful moment um, as the sun shone in the... At the I think of all of these projects, all of the past utopia projects, this was probably my favourite. Mm. Because of that, the fact that, you know, there was mm. involvement mm. of a large group of people from outside mm. getting swept up in the moment, I think, 
of all of the utopian moments that we've witnessed, that was perhaps the most profound one for me. So I think that I mean, we talked quite a lot about how people could lend their, I and mean, it happens, in fact, around the whole of Utopia. How, yeah. Who are the audience? Yeah. You know, how are they involved in this big story that's unfolding at Somerset House about Utopia 2016? Um, and the, the, the wall that's on the right-hand side of that picture has just been buzzing with lots of different, like, wonderful points um, in loads of different languages, you know, so there's been Japanese and, and other and it's sitting on that wall. And it, I mean, obviously, audiences and, and, and visitors leaving their ideas and feedback isn't necessarily a new idea, but I think that, again, it comes back to the word utopia and, and how people gather that and the time, so time specific. I've just after Brexit, when this all launched, there were so many pieces on that wall that were all about, you know, the EU is, my city would be more utopian if we were in, still in the EU, that type of stuff. And mm -hmm. so um, I think it provides a, a very, a nice kind of jumping off point for everybody. Um, and so we really wanted to bring audiences' voices into so much of Utopia. Some of the responses on the wall, um I was having a look at it today. I mean, obviously it's changed, right, over the course of yeah. the months. Uh, but there was quite a few on there that were things like uh, free puppies or mm. uh, free ice cream. Uh, and actually, although it's funny, that has a really strong uh, utopian tradition <laughs> behind it. Um, one of the original uh, utopias was this thing called the land of cocaine, um, which is not the kind of banker's paradise, it sounds like. Um, it's... Uh, spelled differently, and it's a kind of medieval peasant utopia. Um, and there's, you know, there's paintings by people like Peter Bruegel where mm. it's essentially peasants lying on the ground, and there's cooked chickens flying into their mouths, and there's, you know, wine flowing in the river, and so on. And again, it's directly, uh, it, it's a kind of wish fulfillment, but it comes directly from what must have been awful, you know, living conditions uh, at the time for kind of medieval peasants. Mm. So actually, that kind of idea of like free food, you know. Um, Obviously, it's funny on the surface, but if taken far enough, it's actually quite radical. Yeah. You know, mm. like, free food, <laughs> right? That's the most radical. Like, everyone gets free food. And that, again, that's an idea that resonates all the way through. It's a bit like Big Rock Candy Mountain. Yeah. It's just exactly Absolutely, that same yeah. idea, you know, just people in the Depression singing a mm. song about where they could go, where there was all this, like, you know, unlimited free food. Yeah. I mean, it's really survived, that, yeah. that kind of very basic idea. It's really survived, yeah. So if we could just flick quickly through the next two, because I want, I want to get on to talk to Commissioner about the whole thing. I've just uh, this was another Discord, another mm. one of my favourite of all of the projects. This was excellent. Also yeah. like <clears throat> the most dystopian of them mm. really. This is a project about the housing crisis. Yeah, um, yeah let's uh, let's talk about the housing crisis Reese. I mean this is this I thought was yeah a fantastic piece of work. Yeah I went to visit it um, today. And it is, it's powerful, yeah. definitely. It actually, um, if I could illustrate it by talking about something else briefly, it, mm. it reminded me a lot of um, Penny Woolcock's exhibition Utopia last mm. year in the Roundhouse, mm -hmm. um, where she had a kind of ruined London. Mm. Um, and the ruined London was constructed from ruined utopian dreams, in some sense. Um, and scattered around were these uh, kind of very personal stories that she had gone around uh, the borough of Camden for a number of months and she'd recorded uh, like real people's kind of stories and she'd gone up and down the different kind of demographic uh, demographics and she'd collected a number of different personal tales and she'd, they were playing in small alcoves uh, which were surrounded by these tableaux um, mm. which were kind of representative in some way of, of each person's story um, and the, the kind of individual stories were taken from you know, uh, like working class kids on you know, council estates, from kind of middle class kids, from kind of very rich people, from someone who was abused by his dad and ended up as a drug dealer to a girl who did, made a kind of sexual mistake and then got kind of bullied on Facebook because of it. And the, the kind of result um, of these, this kind of clamor of voices, I suppose, uh, was very powerful. It outlined the kind of reality, and this is, I think, something that's often missing from the way that people interpret utopia, right? Is, is this kind of fundamental reality of the people and their lives mm -hmm. and, the story and their dreams and their desires. Um, and if you're gonna have anything that is remotely resembling a utopia, then you're gonna have to find a way to uh, 
bring together and, and somehow harmonize, which is why the singing one was so beautiful, right? Because harmony is, is this really classical kind of link to mm -hmm. utopia. Ernst Bloch, um, yeah. who's a great kind of utopian, he, he always said that music was the most utopian of the art forms for precisely this reason. Um, it, it brings together you know, different strains into, into a kind of harmony. And in this, <coughs> a very similar setup, I thought, where you had these kind of tableau and you had these real voices and they were from different, uh, different situations. Like there was, there was one woman who, uh, I don't know if anyone's visited this, but there's, there was one woman who was talking about how she, she was quite young and she couldn't afford to get on the housing ladder and the kind of struggle, you know, the kind of millennium kind of struggles with that. <clears throat> In another house, there was a, a lady who uh, owned a house and had another house uh, which she was like letting out. And she was, and that was a very interesting one because that really brought out, for me, this kind of key factor of utopianism, which is the tension between the individual and the social. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she, she is, she, she is repeatedly, and you can tell it pains her. You know, she's repeatedly saying houses are capital assets, and you're a fool not to realise that. You know, um, and so I've lived my life in a way which is which is profitable to me and my family. But, but she, she feels the, the moral wrongness of that. She feels the consequences of that to other people. You know? mm -hmm. But she's trapped, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's a really key point that this really brought out. I mean, it's, it's great that it's about the housing crisis because that's obviously a key thing right now with the rent strike and so on in London. Uh, it was like two weekends ago or something like that. Um, and it's a really kind of key topic. But um, more broadly, it really brings out this tension between the kind of, the, the way that the individual is forced to act in a particular way. We're forced to kind of corrupt our morals, essentially. Mm. Capitalism is often, sorry to do this, but capitalism is often <laughs> sold to us as uh, inevitable, natural, right? Everyone's a rational actor, mm. everyone's out to get the best for themselves. But that only works within a larger system, mm. right? We play the rules of the game. It's true that we're rational actors, but if the game was different, then we would act differently in a rational fashion, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? And so this woman can feel this tension between what she knows is right and yet what is the kind of best move, as it were. And it's very hard not to do what's right for yourself and your family. Mm -hmm. But I think everyone is torn by that tension, which is caused by knowing it's wrong, but that's how things work, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think that is surely the, 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 the beginning for any kind of uh, pushback. I suppose, you know, if it's going to start anywhere, surely it's there in that kind of individual sense of wrongness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of and perhaps like a, the next step would be some kind of communal refusal for what that looks like is, you know, utopian, right? So I think that what's, what's really exciting about the whole year is how many voices there are being represented. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to put all of these in one place, um, you know, I led the website that kind of highlights all of the different, like from the 15 minutes of utopia that have happened in the treasury to all of the, the past utopia projects, the utopian fair, and like all those um, agents, players who kind of played a, either like a little role or a bigger role, you know, all the roles are obviously equally important. And I think that um, it shows that Utopia 2016 is this big democratic voice, voices that, that really looks at what 2016, what's going on in 2016, and what people are thinking about in 2016. And I think that um, it's such a, such a giant landscape that um, if we could form it, like put it into that book or something like that, then yeah. it really would demonstrate, I think, how many, you know, the, this, the site of Somerset House between you know, the Courtauld Kings and, and, and Somerset House have kind of um, laid open the doors for so many people to come in and, and kind of talk through all these different um, points and places. And um, hopefully that, that can mean something. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse, if you would quickly skip over the next slide, because I want to return to that at the <laughs> end. So, this is the, uh, the launch mm -hmm. party, and there's that book we were talking about that's on all of the, uh, all mm -hmm. of the desks. So tell us more about what's going on there, Karishma. Um, well, I, I feel like the year, there hasn't been kind of specific things in stone, and like every single event or project has very much kind of moved and developed in lots of different ways. So we're kind of we're thinking about how do we launch the year? 
and one of the kind of main ambitions for the project was to bring together King's Courtauld and Somerset House mm -hmm. to create something together. And in many ways, there hasn't really been very much joint programming before, so that was a very new landscape. We haven't worked very much with the all the different resident organisations and um, artists that are based in the building. So you know, how how do we bring them together? And maybe in quite like a simple, small way, this was the first time that we've ever been able to invite all those different people to one space before. Um, so it kind of was quite a special moment, a mm -hmm. moment just in that sense that oh, okay. We don't quite know where the year is going to lead us to, but let's let's try, let's do something together, let's see where it goes. So for me, it was quite a special moment. It only lasted about five minutes. And the flag there is that at half mast, or half is it on its way up? It was it was on its way up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then the next slide, you mentioned the fair. So this is both the um, the Utopia Fair on the right, yeah. and the on the left hand side, say something about this, which is the Treasury, which is. It's like basically a library of, of yeah, things uh, that are vaguely associated with utopia. We call it a repository yeah. of ideas. <laughs> um, but actually, Andy, what you were saying earlier about the, the entrance to Paths to Utopia really resonates, actually, because in terms of developing the website, developing the identity generally, developing what the utopia of treasury would be like, one thing we really felt quite strongly is, oh, we need to find a way to take our audiences and our participants away from what they expect. We need to take them to a new place, to a different place. Um, how do you do that? I mean, obviously, any project you want to look and feel different from the next, but actually, especially the Utopia Treasury, it's a very all-encompassing, uh, quite strange alien space that you kind of think, oh, is this a bit 80s? Is this a bit colourful? But it, it's really interesting to see people act in these spaces because mm -hmm. they do just start acting differently because they're, they're obviously all of a sudden not in the same building. Um, and the Utopia Fair, a bit like you said before as well about when Paths opened, it was the Friday that we launched the Utopia Fair, which was all these different groups from all over the country coming together to uh, show their different projects that they'd been working uh, in different communities um, about. It was a very strange moment because it was after that Brexit uh, announcement, so it was just the Friday morning that we all found out about it. So kind of woke up in the morning and thought, oh, is, is this a bit strange to have people from all over the UK coming together in this kind of quite, we don't quite know what was happening moment. But it was so important and comforting, I think, because whatever your political standpoint, it kind of became this strange, gentle, safe space mm. that people were exploring their own different versions of uh, a better way of living, a better way of... Uh, having a relationship with their community, what, whatever their project was about, it kind of, I don't know, it just it just made it a very kind of like gentle, safe space for people to kind of talk about their their worries about their future and all this kind of thing. So it was an interesting weekend. And then the last, the very last slide um, just shows us, well, it's the website, but it's the website. gives a, a cross section of some of the uh, disparate events that, that went on across the whole Utopia piece. Yeah, I mean, there's been hundreds and hundreds, really. Um, but again, the kind of look and feel of the website, I suppose, was how how do you take people to a different space? How how do, how do you make it not just another uh, series of events by a couple of arts organisations and universities? Like, what, what can we do to kind of shake it up a little bit? Um, and uh, Fraser Muggeridge, the designer, originally, which we kind of we, uh, compromised on in the end, he wanted all the text to be in Utopian. And we're kind of, well, that, that's great. And, you know, it, I mean, I suppose that's part of the kind of linguistic thing. You know, how do you take people to a different place? How do you start getting them to think in a different way? There was quite a lot of kind of suggestions that were quite extreme. Mm. So I think in this project and lots of others, we've, we've explored the, the kind of the most extreme uh, Im imagination possibilities but we just kind of found the compromises in that. But it's been really important to kind of not think, oh no, we can only do this. We really have explored the kind of quite crazy things, which has been good. Okay, just one more thing to finish off then, Jesse, if you take us back to that, to the map, if we can. Andy, what's going on here? That is um, a little project called um, My Utopia. So audiences in past Utopia um, and maybe further afield, they're invited to 
consider what their utopia consists of. And so we had lots of conversations about um, what questions are important to ask people to kind of gather their um, thoughts on what their utopia like, might look like. And then we, could we compare them? Is there any kind of research that could be interesting to come out of this? And so um, there are so many places you can go. And that kind of in itself was um, a kind of a bit debilitating to begin with. And so we um, created a, a questionnaire that people can do. So it's 16 questions long. Um, and at the end of those 16 questions, you have found, you know, you've essentially created your utopia. So the first question is, how important is space travel to you? Um, and so some of the questions are quite specific, some of the questions are quite broad, and I think it just highlights the, the complexities of considering utopia. Mm. That actually once you start analysing it, and especially once you bring the, the reality of trying to achieve it um, into that notion, like, where do you stop? You know, actually, you can't stop. And, and so, you know, and therein lies the, the kind of the individual versus the society versus the, um, what, I, what can I do today? Well, I can't do anything. One person can't do anything alone. You know, all these kind of ideas. And so, um, because every, all of this is obviously, um, so that's obviously a brain. So the island is a brain, a Google map. And so all of these are, and there must be about a thousand of them now, uh, people have cre answered those 16 questions. Those little pins on that map are arranged that the ones people have answered similarly will be close, to, close together and differently or far apart. Um, and so notionally that represents differing points of view if people have obviously answered honestly to all the questions. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of that map that doesn't have any of the points on it. Which I think, you know, so they're from, for me, they're now frontier towns um, that kind of sit at various areas. And I'm really intrigued. I don't know what, what you would need to answer to be right at the top or right at the bottom. Actually, a coastal town. There are no coastal towns in, in this utopia. Um, and so some of the, the little towns that are sitting by themselves, that like this, this wonderful little remote village that you might want to go and visit, that things happen differently. Um, but one of my one of my favorite favorite moments was before we opened, we had a group of um, teenagers kind of come around from the school grade, just a random drop in essentially, and they, they wandered through the exhibition, and and a couple of them had stopped at this, and you know we had no idea yet at that point really how people might respond to to doing these questions and getting involved, and and so. Um, one of the one of the questions were, is um, how important is monogamy to your utopia? Um, and so these these couple of teenagers were kind of um, having this wonderful argument about how natural is monogamy or not. And so it was just such this lovely moment of people were engaging with the idea, people were engaging with um, you know in this specific moment that question, but obviously bringing their own opinions and their own thoughts on um, what they'd learned, what they understood, how they felt in that day into kind of, and you know, I just sat back and gone, okay, cool, hopefully this is therefore going to work. And, you know, we were a little concerned that um, obviously people might, but they then name their own utopia. And so I think the most common name for a utopia in this is happiness. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably the most common. If people don't use their own name, so there's lots of like Joe and Henry and um, sitting on the, the map of utopia. So if people want to go and live in Joe, then they can find it somewhere on... I think there's a river. It looks like a river that, that sits through the brain. OK, well, I think that's... Uh, happiness is a, is a good point for us to finish. Not just this conversation, but all ten of these, uh, these conversations. And so as this is the last one, there's not one next week for me to tell you about. But as I mentioned, you can find this and all of the previous talks on the King's website. And it remains for me to say... If you would say thank you to um, to Karifa Rafferty, Andy Franskoviak, and Dr. Rhys Williams, thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>